You're welcome at this time to pull out your handouts that are in your bulletins. For those, again, streaming online, we invite you to download the uh, What Does It Mean to Love handout for the We Really Do Need Each Other series. That, again, is on our website at www.holytrinityeastpgh.com. So probably if you're streaming this, you are likely streaming it from the same website. And so you're welcome to download it. It will help you follow along as a part of the sermon today. But I want to read to you our lesson that is appointed for this Sunday in the season of Lent. It's from the book of Luke, the 15th chapter. And this is one of those famous passages of Scripture, one of my favorite stories and parables of Jesus. And I hope it is one of yours too. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered amongst themselves, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to the father, Father, give me a share of my estate. So the father divided the property between them. Not long after, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And there he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed on pigs, or feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So when, the time came, when he came to his sentence, senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare, but here I am starving to death? So I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive again, was lost and so is now found. So they then began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called to one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf, he is because he has him back safe and sound. So the older brother answered, or the older, older brother became very angry and refused to go in. So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you've never given me one of the young goats so that I could celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad for this day your brother who was dead is now alive. He is lost, but he is now found. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Bless this lesson today. Bless our time together. Open up our hearts so we might hear you, O God. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I already mentioned you, this is one of my favorite parables of Jesus, and I hope it is one of yours as well. And it's often referred to, in fact, most of our translations refer to it as, what do we call it? The prodigal, prodigal son. And I really, think that this, I really think that this lesson is mislabeled and misnamed. I really think that this, this parable, am, am I messing things up, Terry? Okay. I really think that this parable should be listed as the loving father. The loving father. And I'll tell you why, because it really is about the love of the father and the great lengths that the father would go to to win over his son. And so when we look at our lesson today, let me just throw out some of these things that the father did to win over his son. First thing he did is he gave his wealth to his son. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute your child comes up to you and says, you know what, I'm not waiting for you to kick the bucket. I want my inheritance right now. I think that would be a little bit offensive to most of us, but that's basically what this son did. He wanted his inheritance now so he could do what? Go and squander it and play with it and have a lot of fun with it while he was still young. It's kind of where we get that phrase about sowing your wild oats, right? Going out and having a great time and uh, just 
spending it all on wild living. And that's what the son does. And it tells you something about this father. The father just says, okay, here you go. He probably knows it's not good for him, but he gives it to him anyway. Look at the second one. He let go of his son, even though his son was being reckless. Now, there's some of us parents who are really kind of like helicopter parents, and we just hover around our kids, and every time they fall and scrape their knee, we're there to kiss it and make it feel better and uh, help every boo-boo go away, and we're there all the time. It's not always the best thing in the world. Sometimes kids need to make their own mistakes. Sometimes we need to allow kids to be reckless, even if it risks their life. Sometimes it's the only way we learn. And I bet you every single one of us can tell us stories about how you really made a mess of your life sometimes, but you learn from those things. Let me just tell you, I wish I'd known the, the name of this one, but there was a one of the Star Trek episodes of The Next Generation in which Captain Picard has the opportunity to go back and correct all of the mistakes that he made in his life. And the one mistake that he goes back and corrects is this fight that he has in the bar. And so instead of getting in a fight in this bar and being this brawling big guy, he ended up getting thrust through with a sword that almost killed him and, and, uh, and, and it, 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 it pierced his heart and he nearly died and he not had a heart transplant. He decides to go back and live this event over again, that reckless spirit. And now we jump forward to 30 years in the future and he's not the captain of the Enterprise. Guess what he is? He's simply a crew person. Why? Because sometimes the reckless things that we do in life make us who we are. And so he wanted to go back and relive it again for the third time and make some of the same, same stupid mistakes he made as a young person because that made him the leader that he was. So I think this is a very good father. He allows his son to be reckless, make some stupid mistakes, but as a result, He's probably going to be forged as a young man. Uh, this man, this young man's future is going to be forged in some of the mistakes that he makes. Now, what's interesting? I tell you about the great love of the father. What's he do after this? His son comes home, and the father does something that maybe you don't notice in English as an embarrassment. But what does the father do? He runs to meet his son. That is not something a father in that day in that culture would do. He would have sat and waited for his son to come to him. And if he did go to his son, he would certainly not have run. And he certainly wouldn't have blubbered over his son and fallen at his son's feet and kissed him and hugged him and grabbed him and, and done all the things that this father did. So what did this father do? He humiliated himself before his son. That's, ri that's ridiculous. Everybody in the culture was looking to say, why would a father do that? This father was wrong. But this father loved his son so much that he humiliated himself before his reckless son. He went on, he paid his son's debts. How amazing is that? He threw a party in celebration for his returned son, a son that most believed was unworthy of such an experience. So the older son is not the only one who's offended by this, by the way. And then he forgives his son and welcomes him back into the household. But this is not all. Notice that as a result, the father is willing to strain his relationship with the older son in order to welcome the younger son in. Now, for those of you who are in a family that had two or more kids, and if you're the youngest, you know that you got away with a heck of a lot that your older siblings were not able to do. I can tell you for a fact I'm the youngest son of three, and I got away with crap that my brothers could never get away with. Terry, did that happen with you? Or no, you had your sisters there to put you in order, didn't you? A little yeah, bit sometimes. Little but I bet you they would have a different story. They would say, all these things that Terry got away with. If I were to ask my brothers, they'd say, I can't believe what my brother David got away with. Because he was the youngest son. He got away with everything. It is not fair. Well, that's the way the oldest sibling is feeling. And in the story for today that Jesus tells, really the older siblings are us. What, how do we respond when somebody comes to a relationship with Christ or brand new in our church, are we offended by their presence because it seems like they get to take advantage of all the things and opportunities that we never got to when we were growing up or when we were new members of the church? You know, we need to get that, that attitude and it needs to change, is what Jesus is saying. But ultimately, again, as I told you, I think the point of this parable 
is how loving this Father is. And that relates to what we want to look at this week in our 40 days of community as we continue our study of the book of 1 John chapter 3. How are we to best love each other? Jesus just showed us a parable of a loving father who went to great lengths to love his son. But John also tells us a little bit about how we are called to love each other. And so in this case, John defines love as one who lays down his life for others. Isn't that what the father did in her parable for today? He gave his life. He poured it out for his son. John defines it in a similar way, not a surprising fashion, because after all, John was the beloved disciple and certainly was the one who was with Jesus through the thick and thin, through good and through bad. And he is trying to communicate to us what Jesus meant by love. He says that if one truly is to love another person, we need to lay ourselves, our lives down for each other. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, so that means I have to give myself up for everybody. I need to die for everybody. But you notice that's not what the Bible says. It says lay down one's life. We interpret lay down one's life as giving up your life because that's what Jesus did for us. But... That's Jesus' deal. I'm going to tell you what, you cannot save one person's life by giving your life for them. God isn't asking us to die for other people. God is asking us to live our lives for other people. Your life is meaningless. Your, I should say your death is meaningless. You can't die for other people because Jesus already has done that for us. Your death means nothing in the larger scope of the kingdom of heaven. So what God is actually asking us to do is live for other people. If you were to die, it's just a waste of opportunities. Now, I, I was actually uh, talking to this very thing about my with my kids and my track team. Of course, I'm a coach for those who don't know online or watching. I'm a track coach as well as being a pastor, and I coach teenagers. I'm at one of the local high schools. And I was talking to our kids about this. I, I, I said, uh, what does it mean to lay down your life? And they said, oh, all the kids, teenagers again, 15, 16-year-olds. Oh, we'd die for everybody. If, if I had to give my life, I'd give my life for people. And Coach shows, we give our lives for you. And I looked at my kids, one girl, Hannah. She said, I'd give my life for you. And I said, Hannah, you're stupid. I said, that's dumb. I'm a 50-year-old man. Why would you give your life for me when you've got 60 years, 70 years in front of you? You need to live your life, not die for me. Because only Jesus' death means anything in terms of salvation. And she's kind of like, oh, well, what do you mean by that? I'm willing to die for you. I said, I'm, there's only two people in my life I'm willing to die for. They're sitting right back here. The rest of you, sorry, you're on your own. Because as one of our members, Bruce, said, Hey, you know, if the bus is coming, I'll yell a warning to you, and I'll scream if you get hit by it, but I'm certainly not going out of my way to save your life. Isn't happening. Because God hasn't called me to die for you. God has called me to live my life for you. To lay down one's life means to invest my life in the lives of others, and I can't do that if I'm dead. I hope that makes some sense. So let's go on. John continues to say that if we are to love each other, we need to give ourselves through not just our words, but by our actions. You know, you can say all day to somebody, I love you, I love you, I love you, but if you're not following up with your actions, it's meaningless. And the same thing is true in our relationship with God. Have you ever seen people who, who are always crafting and, and working on their testimony to tell everybody about how much they love God? And you know what? I don't think God cares about what your testimony is if it's not followed up by actions. I think the true testimony of the Christian life is how much you care for people by your actions. That's what John wants us to know. If we truly love God, we show how much people we love God by how we love other people. True love of God is ultimately only ex expressed by living in a community with other Christians and by laying our lives down for them. You know, every single week 
often, regularly, I meet people who say, well, I believe in God, but I don't really need to be in a church, and I just can worship God just at home, just fine, by myself, in my bedroom, behind my closed door. And I just kind of look at them and say, well, wait a minute, are you really reading the scriptures? Because the Bible is very clear. The Christian life is a participation sport, a communal sport in which we participate in it together and love each other. There's no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. We are called to love each other. and We express our love of God, not by closing our door and worshiping God in the quiet of our own room, but by gathering together with other Christians who drive us crazy, by the way, and we're ready to strangle them because they're hypocrites. Well, so am I. But we gather together as the body of Christ and love the people that God has put in front of us. That's how the love of God is expressed in our lives. Look at letter B under number two. John goes on to say that our actions always speak more loudly than our words anyway. In 1 John 3, verse 17, he defines love and giving. How do we give? How do we love? If you want to love, you got to give. you got to give to other people. How do, you, how do you give or how are you supposed to do that? John defines it for us. He says what you should do is you should see people who are in need, feel it in your innards, not your heart. We say, oh, we feel it in my heart. Isn't that nice? Bless my heart. We're not talking about your heart. We're talking about your innards. Have you ever, have you ever looked at somebody and said, oh, I just feel their pain. You're just twisted up inside because of your feelings towards them. You're just so conflicted and twisted and, and your stomach hurts because you love them and care for them so much and you just want to help them. That's how John defines love, that you're just twisted up inside because you love them so much. So you see those in need, you feel the need the, in your innards, uh, the love for them, and you yearn to help them. That's what John says is true love. And ultimately, John's focus may be on loving fellow believers. As you read the lesson, it's going to talk about how we love fellow believers, but that doesn't mean to the exclusion of non-Christians. We ought to love everybody, whether they're Christians or not. But John is focusing on our love of Christians because we've got to start with our brothers and sisters who are right in front of us. How are we going to love the world if we can't love our brothers and sisters right beside us to the right and to the left? If I don't love the people around me in my church, I'm not going to love the people out there in the world. So John wants us to know that we have an obligation of love towards our brothers and sisters in Christ because of what God has done for us. And once we love each other, we will be a more effective witness and better lovers of the world. So therefore, John tells us, living life within the context of the Christian community is not optional, but it is the way that we love God. So let's look at the last part of our sermon for today. But what is it that is keeping us from being more effective as a church of Christ and loving other people? And... Notice letter A under this. What keeps us from loving other people? Because we thing eyes them. Do you understand what I mean by that? We thing eyes them. We create objects. We make objects over out of them. We uh, what do we do? We make objects of derision of people with whom who do not share our values. If you you know what I'm talking about, if you go to Facebook, you see it all the time. People dismissing groups of people. I hate stupid people. Well, you know maybe you're somebody else's stupid people. Did you ever think of that? In fact, I guarantee you, if you've ever put and posted one of those things on your Facebook page, I see stupid people all around me. I guarantee you, you're one of the stupid people that somebody else sees in their life. Maybe we need to stop objectifying people and stop uh, being so divisive and hateful of other people. That stupid people you think is so stupid is a child of God that you are supposed to love. And so maybe... How you're supposed to love them is stop dismissing them just because they don't live by your standards. You notice that Jesus doesn't thing eyes people. He doesn't go around and say, oh, you're all stupid people. He loves the people that he's surrounded with. People that you dismiss as sheeple. They're just sheeple. I don't think we should have any business using those types of words or phrases in our Christian vocabulary. We should not be dismissing people just because we disagree with them or disagree with their values. 
So what do we do? We create stereotypes out of people and therefore allows us to dehumanize people, making it easier to dismiss them. I want to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a couple stories here. One is, uh, we, 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 uh, for those who have been following along with the drama in our house, so we've actually moved our horse to a new barn. And the other day, Chris and I were there, and I got to meet this really cool girl by the name of Kelsey. Uh, she had to have been maybe 24, 25. I'm just guessing. I don't know because I really didn't see her. Guess what? She was wearing, wearing what's called a uh, niqab. I believe it's called a niqab. Uh, I'd have to look that up, but I believe it's what it's called. Not a burqa, but a niqab. I don't know if you know what the difference is. A burqa covers the entire face, and you've got the eye covering over the eye, so you can't even see the eyes. And the cob covers the face and everything but the eyes, so you can see the eyes. You can actually see their eyes, but you can't see anything else. So I walked in. It was kind of a shocking thing. You see somebody there that you, you know, you don't. We don't usually expect that. And so I said hello. She said hello to me, and we start talking. And next thing you know, it we talk about her and her life and about her faith and. She's asking me about my faith and so forth, and she said, well, you know, I wasn't always a Muslim. I said, well, tell me about your story. And so she starts sharing me about how she became a Muslim. She said, I was an atheist. My father's an atheist. My mom's an agnostic. They're very hateful people. My family can be very tough. You know, I, you know, I was one of the, the, the hard, hardcore people that just dismissed anybody who didn't think the way I did. She went to Point Park University here in Pittsburgh, and she said, I just... Uh, I just, uh, I just had such hate and such anger in my life. And she said, and then all of a sudden, some of the Muslim students, I started interacting with them, and I learned about God's love for me. You wouldn't expect that from Muslim, because, you know, we have these, what do we have? These stereotypes the way Muslims are. Oh, they're all hateful. People are all out to get us. They're about hate and anger. Oh, she found the love of God through the Muslim outreach at Point Park University, okay? And so she starts talking about how she found the love of God and how, why she's dressed the way she is and, and about her husband and how she fell in love and, and you know, and just uh, on and on. And she says, you know, and my, her parents, she prays for her parents every day and she calls her parents every single day. She said, that's one thing that changed my life. She said, I couldn't stand being around my parents. I call my parents every single day and I just tell them I love them because they just need to know that I love them. And she said, and I would never push my faith on them. I wouldn't do that to them. I just want them to find joy and happiness and love that I have. That's all I want for them. That's all I want for the world. I don't, and she went on to say, I don't want people to be, have my belief. I just want people to have hope and love in their lives. And so she goes on and talks about this stuff and really was, was such a pleasant conversation with Kelsey. And it just blew away all the stereotypes that people have about what, what a Muslim is like and all those dismissive things that we say about Muslims. No, I'm not a universalist. I believe in Christ. I believe that Jesus is the way that we bring, that, that the salvation of God is brought to this world. But I am also very grateful that Kelsey found that God is a God of love and that her life was touched by God. And so no longer... In the Christian life is the world about us versus them. It's not us versus the Muslims. It's not us versus the Jews. It's not us versus the atheists. All of us are us. God loves all of us. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no them. God wants to bring all of us to a relationship with him so that we are all in this life together. I hope I stress that effectively. Again, I'm not a universalist, but I do believe that God doesn't want to create an us versus them mentality. We have to stop creating that type of mentality and understand that God wants all of us to be us. It's not the sheeple and us smart people. It's not the stupid people and me smart person. It's not us Christians and those Muslims. All of us are the people whom God loves. I'm going to tell you another story. Another true story. About 15 years ago in our church, we had a series of three interns, one of them named Michael. Michael, if those who remember Michael, um, <laughs> Michael, I remember when he came to this country, one of the things that he was struck with was 
how we treated black people. He says, I don't get some of the racism and the attitudes towards black people in this country. And so we talk about it. He said, yeah, I know. I mean, it, it's frustrating because you saw that from some of the members who, who just would say disparaging thing about, things about black people. Again, they thingized black people. And uh, instead of it was us, white people, and those black people. So it was a thingy type of thing that we did with black people. And I said, I know. It's problematic. And we talked about it. And I said, well, you know, I mean, but you could probably understand it, Michael, a little bit better if you think about the attitude and the bigotries that some Slovaks have towards the Romani, what we typically call in our country gypsies. And he looks at me kind of strange and he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, the Slovaks have certain same type of bigotries towards the Romani and the gypsies. He said, oh, no, well, the Romani, they're all thieves. <laughs> and I said, you just proved my point. You thingized the Romani and the gypsies. They're all thieves. And so they deserve to be treated that way. I said, you've just done the same thing that a lot of white people do to black folks in this country. We thingize them. We dehumanize them. We make objects of derision out of them. And there's no place for that attitude in the kingdom of heaven. We are called to lay down our lives for each other. And so how do we do that? So I just put some things up here. Some of them are, you will notice, are preaching at me directly. So when your daughter, my daughter, comes up to me and wants to talk, and I'm knee deep into something or elbow deep into something, I'm reading or doing or whatever, what I need to do is listen to her and acknowledge her presence and say, I see you. Don't always do that. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But she needs to know that I am on her side and listening to her. And when that person who annoys you and everybody else, you have somebody like that in your life, and, and you know what I'm talking about, the person you walk into the store and you're in the grocery store and you all of a sudden see a one aisle down and you go ducking into another aisle in hopes that, oh, I sure hope they don't see me. I sure hope they don't see me. And all of a sudden you're smack dab into them. You're like, ah. I was really hoping to avoid that person. That's the type of person that I'm talking about. So you know who they are. Everybody in their life has people who annoy you so much, and everybody else, you don't want to be around them. The person that you don't want to look at, because as soon as you look at them and give them any attention, it's like, oh, you're paying attention to me, and they start into it, and you're like, I don't want that, I don't want that, and then they require any type of obligation for me. That's the person, you want to avoid that person. But they look you in the eye, they finally catch up to you. They run into you in the aisle. They look in the eye with that glimmer and that hope in their life that you will just acknowledge that they are alive. And you know what? It is in those cases that what we need to do is recognize that they are human beings by smiling at them and saying what? Hello. So that we recognize that they are more than just an annoyance to us. Or how about the person that we see that's in need? If you have the means of help to help them, you give them of what you have. When you see that Muslim woman wearing the, the burqa, or that Latino speaking Spanish, you know, how many times have you seen that? He speak no Spanish allowed in here. Well, come on, people. There are some people that speak Spanish in their homes, and there's a lot of your families that spoke Slovak in the homes. There's a lot of your families that spoke German in their homes. There's a lot of your families that spoke Italian in the homes. So don't give me this that somehow these Latino families, because they're speaking Spanish, are somehow different than your families were when they came to this country. That's a bunch of bull. So when they're speaking Spanish, or when you see a teenage black young boy who's got his, his butt hanging out because his pants are hanging down, halfway down his butt, you know, and you're like, ah, oh, shameful, whatever. Or you see that southern redneck, or you go to Michigan and you see a Michigan redneck, because you know there are northern rednecks too. You know what you do? You look at them, you smile, you see them as a person and not as a stereotype. Can you do that? That's what it means to love. When you give without expecting thanks or repayment or recognition, that's what it means to love. 
That's what love means, Reuben Walsh says. I see you. I hear you. I know that you are here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today recognizing that we often fail in our obligation of love to each other. Maybe it's because we don't understand how overwhelming the love of God is for us. Because everybody that we dismiss, everybody that we make an object out of, everybody that we make a stereotype out of, well, you know, we're somebody else's stereotype. That was done to us. So why would we treat other people that way? We are on the outs, but yet because of what Jesus Christ does, we're now on, on the inside. So let us stop making life about us versus them. Help us to make it about all of us, about the human race, about people wherever they are. Because we are called to love people as we've been loved by you. To lay down our lives, to invest ourselves in those around us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray.